If you have your Bibles today, turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 14. What is the theme of the service today? Does anybody know what the theme of the service is today? Christ alone. Christ alone. Uh, all right, so I'm going to give you some verses to hang your hat on that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to make a, di a couple of disclaimers. So God have mercy on anybody that fast forwards through all the different things of the day and they don't get this part. This part you've got to get. And uh, I really, really desire that every person that's a part of this church get this part. The part that I'm going to share today, uh, what I'm going to share about, is a subject that most pastors will never, 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 ever really talk about. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Happy is the man that is not condemned in the things that he allows, that he alloweth. This is a powerful, powerful verse. But it's based on Romans 14 in that whole chapter. And so today the disclaimer is, I am not making an, an excuse for sin in anyone's life. I want you to hear that. This message is not to give you a license to just do anything you want to do. But on the other side of the coin, the subject of condemnation is a subject that Satan loves because he is the accuser of the brethren. So we must find a balance between knowing God and knowing what's right and knowing the word and condemnation because you can know the word and the word can bind you up but if you know the truth the truth will make you free and anything in your life that you're saying is the word that brings you into bondage, it's not truth. Now, there are multitudes of pastors today that will preach condemning messages. I know of a multitude of church members that have said to me, not our church members, but from other churches, well, I'll just tell you, I can't go to a church unless the preacher steps on my toes. Well, let me ask you a question. What kind of parties do you like? You like to go to parties where somebody comes up and stomps on your big toe, stomps on your toes? That there is fighting words, you know. I mean, you, you going to come up and stomp on my toes? I'm going to stomp on your head. You know, that's the human reaction. But no, the pious, the pious hypocrite would say, but I would just turn the other cheek. Yeah, well, when you, get, when you run out of cheeks to turn, then what are you going to do? You're going to become a doormat to the people that love people that turn cheeks. Now there comes a time when you have to stand up to people stepping on your toes. That makes sense? I mean, you come up and just stomp my just stomp on my toes. And, and you're not gonna see the love of God come out of my face. 
the first reaction is going to be a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to want to apply the laws of physics, which says to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So without thinking, I may come upside your head if you come upside my toes. So I'm not going to make a justification for sin today, but I am going to help people. I'm going to help you today to be healed. I'm going to help you today to become blessed. So look at Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Now, Who's he talking about? One that is weak in the faith. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Verse 2. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Did you know that the word of God calls people that have a vegetarian doctrine, it calls them weak? One that is weak Eateth herbs. There are people in the church of the living God that want to bring you under this great truth of vegetarianism. And it's just another strand of legalism. But how are we supposed to deal with that? Let him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. What do you mean? Let, let not him that eateth. Let not him that eateth meat despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth judge him. Uh, let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. God receives the people that eat meat, and he receives the people that eateth not meat. Amen. One time, uh, one of my sons were, were dating a girl, and she came to eat with us at our house, and we had chicken. Chicken, for goodness sake. And she sat at the table and almost threw up as she saw us going after that chicken. <laughs> there are those today that do not believe that you can have a bare skin rug in your house. You cannot have a fox fur coat. And so we walk around with our fox fur coats if somebody is old enough to have one. And they'll say, this is synthetic. <laughs> and I'm telling you today that we need this message. Because Satan is the condemner. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let, what does it say? Let every man be condemned if he does not observe the Sabbath. No. Yeah. It says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. What does my mind have to do with it? It's what the Word says, brother. And people are sword fighting with the Word of God. And now today, we have Pentecostal seventh days, Adventist, I mean seventh days, people. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not that day, or the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. Chicken, beef, 
Buffalo. For he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and gives God thanks. God bless these broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, beans. And he, he gives thanks too. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. You know that Jesus Christ is Lord of the dead and of the living? But why dost thou judge thy brother? And he says, let me get to the crux of the matter. Why do you judge your brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Why do you put your brother aside? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. And I'm going to stand there thinking I've lived my life right before God. Then you're going to stand there thinking you've lived your life right before God. Then I'm going to stand there saying, but I saw what you did or wrote on Facebook. <laughs> That's what John was saying today. He says he sees, when did we come to this? How, how did we come to this? But the Lord is so faithful. I'm going to tell you, in my life, when I, when I get when I mess up during the night, God will give me a word. And if I'll listen to that word, it'll bring me out of that messy state. We've, we've had people leave our church because I didn't Rebuke people harder. Put them under discipline. And I let things slide. No, it's, it's not a matter of letting things slide. <clears throat> it's a matter of growing up in God. Because Pat Jones can testify. Carolyn can testify. And some others can testify that some things that I felt strongly about 30 some years ago, I've made a few corrections and a few adjustments. And it's easy to preach messages about taste not, touch not, handle not. We've had prophets of God come through here and will give an altar call about smoking cigarettes, and every single person that smoked, that had any issues with smoking at all, when they left the church, they felt like smoking was a cardinal, major, absolute, the chiefest of sins in the whole world. And if you defile the temple of God, <laughs> and you can get to humming with this stuff. You can hum as a preacher. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. It's easy to do. But then, the next week, you'll see a story. I grew up in Druryville, Virginia. There was a woman there over 100 years old. I think she died when she was 106. And the newspaper asked her, what's the secret for your long health? She says, I don't know. But every day, I smoke me a cigar. And I eat ham every day. Now, 
Anybody that knows anything about serving the Lord knows you should not eat ham. Hallelujah. <laughs> For that pig is unclean. Glory to God. <laughs> and yet Paul says, one eats that ham. You know, the, the the man w was going to the Catholic church and he saw them taking communion. And on Friday, the Catholics in those days were condemned if you did not eat fish. You could not eat regular meat, bless God. You know. And it was their custom, their tradition. The traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. And so he's eating that. So the priest is looking out over the fence to see what the guy's going to do. Because he just preached his, he did his best delivery in the Catholic Church about eating fish on Friday. And so he goes... Uh, he saw the priest hold the wafer up in the air and says, this is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ. So he lays hands on his T-bone steaks he's cooking. And he says, you were born a cow, you were raised a cow, and now you're a fish. <laughs> Smith Wigglesworth got into this thing and he was at the, he was preaching in England, and a lot of those Englanders had some hog farms, pig farms. I was with Sedley Pimlot in England, in Norwich, England, and he had over 1,000 hogs he raised every year. And he would raise them, and those hogs, would, their feet would never touch the ground. He had automatic sprinklers that would blast through the hog pens and blast everything out that wasn't of God. And he had automatic feeders that would come, bring the feed through and drop off feed at each place. And those pigs were born, they were bred, born, and died and never had their feet touch the ground. And he had, he put his put all of that, the thousand pigs, downwind from his house. Bless God. Thank the Lord he did. And he was a very wealthy man. And Sedley Pimlot was one of those kind of pig farmers that would that love the Lord with all his heart. And he was the kind of man that Smith Bugglesworth would have made great friends with. I'm not sure he ever knew Smith himself, but one day Smith Bugglesworth was out of house and he, they were going to feed him pork. And if Smith had made a vow before God, I'm not going to eat pork again because it's unclean and your wisdom is so great in the Old Testament. Your word is so wise, Lord. And he, find himself in, he found himself in a very precarious situation. And they said, Smith, would you pray over the meal at this pompous house, the pig farmer's house? And he reached his hands out over the table and he said, Lord, if you can bless under grace what you cursed under the law, do something with this pig on this table. <laughs> then he ate some pig. You see, we paint ourselves in the corners by the things that we preach and embrace and sometimes our pride refuses to let us walk back over the paint to get out of the room there was a great prophet of God in the northern part of Richmond and he preached all his life there will never be a knife of a surgeon ever touch my body and he died at a young age much younger than he should have died. He preached, the same preacher that preached, you should live to be 70. 
God has promised you 70 years. And yet he died at a young age because he ate so much pork because he had freedom in the Lord. He ate things that he should not have eaten. A lot of fat. It was great eating at his house. because They had feast, man. They had everything. Spreads of food. They loved to eat. And the doctor said, your heart, you need a bypass surgery. But he could not get the bypass surgery. A surgery that in his day when he died was just a normal operating procedure almost. Hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people have had bypass surgeries. Maybe they give it to some that don't need it. But if he had just done that, he would have lived much longer. Painting themselves in the corner. The corner. Leading people to adopt his sermons and his preaching and his beliefs. But the Bible says, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Verse 5 says. And then verse 10 says, but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written... As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let, not therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I think it would be wisdom if you don't put on Facebook that you love meat. <laughs> also, don't put on Facebook if you're a vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian. I just don't believe in eating meat. You're going to cause me that love T-bone steaks to stumble. <laughs> I don't think you should put on Facebook your celebrations because Facebook is a public means of Communication. Don't put on there that you had a nice party last night and you got a little tipsy. Leave your tipsiness to the privacy of your own emails. Not Facebook. And don't talk about being tipsy to someone that believes that to touch alcohol is a sin. See, we can get those scriptures in us that says about the wine bibbers. See, and we can't even bib any wine. And, and your pastor's never touched a drop of alcohol in his whole life. But I cannot condemn those that have a little wine with their meal. And one of the apostles wrote, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. I don't know what he was talking about, but I know it ain't grape juice. Because I'll tell you what happens when you drink grape juice. It can blow you up. <laughs> Come on, saints. Better that it's fermented before it goes into your stomach than it ferments after it goes into your stomach. Hello, is anybody still there? But not wanting anyone to stumble, I will tell you, I have never touched it. And for me to drink it, it is a sin. But I quit judging you that drink it. Hello, Dolly. I'm not going to leave the church because the pastor doesn't condemn all drinking. My granddaddy never drank a drop of alcohol in his life. Granddaddy Daltrey, my mother's father. But in those days, he had a heart condition. And the doctor said to him, every day you go out and you drink 
Every day you drink a beer, he says, I can't do that around my family. Go outside and do it. And they believed that if you drank a beer every day, it would help your, it would kick your heart. It probably kicked other parts of my body if I drank. <laughs> but that's what they told him to do. And with disdain, every day he would go out and drink a beer, just like you drink, you know, alka seltzer. I know, verse 14 says, and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So you know in your heart drinking alcohol is a sin. Then don't drink. And if a brother be grieved by thy meat, now, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with meat for whom Christ is died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things thereby therewith no one, uh, wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. And this is what the Lord dealt with my heart about. It is evil for that man to eat meat if he eateth it with offense. It's not just a matter of sin. It's a matter of evilness. If a man believes, or a woman believes, that he cannot eat meat, let them live without eating meat. And don't eat meat around them without their permission. Without their consent. Somebody say amen. Amen. In Romans 14, let us therefore follow, well, verse 18, for he that in these things serveth God is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. For it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, verse 21, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy. Now watch this word. This word can become a stumbling block to some that are here. This word can make you want to leave this church. But it is the word of God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The guy is read, or the woman's read about eating meat. How horrible it is for your system. How much healthy you are if you just eat string beans, broccoli, cauliflower, squash. 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 You need those yellow vegetables, they tell me. I want to squish the squash. I don't want to eat the squash. And it's not a matter of sin. I can eat squash, but I'd rather take paragoric. And 
some people want to judge you if you like hamburgers. When I start fasting, I can just see quarter pounders. It's amazing the visions you have when you start fasting. And some people want to condemn you. But let me tell you something, folks. I can't condemn myself because if I, if I feel condemned, then when I eat, it becomes evil to me. You want to die younger? You want to die young? Eat what condemns you. Do what condemns you. And at some point, you've got to come to grips with the fact that the word says, Judge not that you be not judged. Now watch this word. I'm going to read it again. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. You have faith? You have faith you can eat meat? Then keep it private. Happy. This verse here will haunt you. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. I'm not going to be brought under condemnation. Yes. Amen. That's right. That's right. If I'm assigned six months on a boat in the Mediterranean, And my wife is not with me. I'm not going to be condemned in the thing that I allow. And I'm not talking about stepping outside of my marriage. There are areas of the word of God that are very great. Before you judge someone on what they're allowing in their life, you need to go up and ask them, can you please explain to me what your reasoning is on this subject? Yes. And then you'll be amazed at what the reasoning is. And people can reason things to a wrong conclusion. And what they have knowledge of today as they continue in God, God will show them that that's not an area that they need to be messing with. It was years ago that I could preach right into your bedrooms. And the Lord said, get out of their bedrooms. And the Lord said to me, until you can reconcile the scripture that says, the marriage bed is undefiled, then stay out of the bedrooms of the people in your church. Some do this and some do that. And God help me, we've never done this and we've never done that. <laughs> but reconcile it. The marriage bed is undefiled. Reconcile it. Do with it what you want. The Bible talks about fornication and adultery, but it doesn't go much further than that. Then blessed is the man, happy is the man that is not condemned in the thing that he alloweth. Now let's go back to that other verse that I said to you that verse 20. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. If you get a hold of a vegetarian and you can prove to them that it's okay to eat meat and you conjole them and you browbeat them and they eat a ham sandwich with you and they feel condemned 
then it's not going to help their body. It's going to hurt them. Let me tell you. This is truth that I'm going to tell you. Okay, I'm going to tell you some truth now. Truth is your body. I've heard two things. I've heard your body is 60 or 70% water. I've heard that it's 90% water. Now, I don't know which is true, but somewhere there's some truth in the fact that your body has a lot of water in it. I also know that they did a test. They put ice cubes, they put water in ice trays. And in one ice tray, they put, I wish to kill you. A piece of paper saying, I wish to kill you. And they put it in each one of those ice cubes, and then they froze it. They took another ice tray, and they put in there, I love you so much and want to be with you. And they put in another ice tray, different things, evil thought, evil sayings. And then they put water from a dirty river, and then they put water from a clean river, and they just froze those things. And then they analyzed the molecules of the water as it froze. And the most beautiful patterns you would ever see in your life are in every single ice cube that says, I love you and want to be with you. Beautiful. Gorgeous. And in some things that they put religious sayings in, you could see a cross formed in the middle of the cube or an eight cross. Absolutely gorgeous. And the ice cubes where I hate you and want to kill you, the ice, the crystals were gnarled and messed up. And if you think that you can override someone else in what they believe is wrong and it bless them you're wrong because anyone that partakes in anything that they're not convinced is okay it becomes a sin to them Even if it's not a sin in the wildest imagination, the stretch of your imagination, it's a sin to them. Because to him to, that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Blessed, happy is the man that is not condemned in the things that he alloweth. And it boils back down to my faith is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Amen. And you cannot have faith in the things of this world. And if your heart condemn you, then you cannot be healed. But if your heart condemn you not, you can be healed. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, I think it is. I'm going to try to find it here as quickly as I can. I've got several pages of notes. The Lord has been working on me concerning this message for the past week. And, and I knew and I know that I'm taking a chance to even preach this because some will say that I'm, gonna, I'm justifying sin in your life. <clears throat> but the message is, the bottom line, so that we, we won't get all messed up about this message today. The message is that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. If you walk in condemnation... Even though you may not be doing anything wrong, but if you're condemned over the thing that you allow, it will kill you. And I'm telling you right now, there are a lot of Christians that are going to their graves early because they heard sermons on 
Ladies, you cannot wear makeup. And then they, may, they wear makeup and they, they walk around. They do it because of the peer pressure of the new kind of uh, religious circles that they now walk in. But they have a tinge of condemnation and wearing makeup, which I'm convinced has never been a sin unless you paint it on 14 layers thick. Make your eyes look like a bat out of hell. <laughs> if you... How in the world did the church world get so messed up that an ear bob will take somebody to hell? That piercing your ears is a sin. How did we get that messed up? But I would rather my wife never pierce her ears unless she can pierce her ears in faith. If you have a sin or what you feel was a sin in your life, when you were a little kid, when you were an older kid, when you were a teenager, and that thing haunts you, and you feel condemned by it, and it never leaves you, I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus is greater than your sin, and you'd better not live another day in condemnation, because it will tear your heart out of your body. And if you walk in fear, men's hearts will fill them for fear. And the Lord said to me, preach this message and tell Janet and tell Beverly. If there is anything that is any way, shape, or form a condemning thought about anything in your past, your present, or your future... Get over it. To the pure. All things are pure. And I'm not talking about incest. I'm not talking about what the Bible blatantly condemns. I'm not talking about homosexuality. But the homosexual should not be condemned. Condemnation will bring sickness, illness. It will mess you up. The condemner is Satan. Watch this. Verse 1 John 2.20 For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. <coughs> Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. <clears throat> Listen to this scripture. Guard your hearts. Amen. For out of your heart is the issues of life. And I'm going to tell you what to guard your heart against. Condemnation. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This word, there's two words for condemnation, or for condemning and condemnation. One is to separate, put us under, to pick out, select, choose, to approve, esteem, or prefer. That's what most of our condemnations are based on, what we prefer, what others prefer. It's, it's an opinion. It's something you deem or think. It's to be opinion, to, to determine, resolve, decree. It's... Uh, in the Strong's, it's 29.19. To those who act the part of judges or arbitrators in matters. And God has not set any of you all up to be the judge or the arbitrator. You may say, well, I know that. Well, you say you know that, but you better make sure that you don't fall into condemnation of yourself Because no one is perfect. Because everyone is working out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Just like I told you the story of my father. Tore pockets out of his shirt until he came to the grips with the fact he could not quit without God's help. And if God didn't give him the power, he, he was going to smoke. He said to the Lord, I'm going to smoke now. And he got out of condemnation. 
He started smoking cigarettes without being condemned. But diligently prayed until God gave him power over it. One day, the Lord said, you've got the power. And he threw the cigarettes out of the truck and never, ever accepted or never, ever wanted or desired another one. God gave him the power. But he didn't cop out saying, this is my only besetting sin. He did not make excuses for his sin. He knew smoking was wrong. He knew God wasn't pleased with it. But you can't walk around with condemnation without getting sick. That's right. It will affect the molecules of your body. Guilt will destroy your soul. Satan is the author of condemnation. And he's the author of judgmental spirits. And this condemnation that we're talking about the first kind is that kind where people prefer esteem it's it's a ladies cannot wear anything that pertaineth to a man well then all you men if you want to be like Jesus wear a robe a dress would be preferred. A kilt would do. <laughs> and the Scottish men don't have uh, <clears throat> prostate cancer like American men do. And I'm not going to go into detail except to say that anyone with any common sense knows that men should be wearing dresses and ladies can wear slacks. Just the anatomy of the men and women will tell you that dresses would be preferred on men and ladies don't have any problems wearing slacks. And make sure, ladies, that when you wear a shirt, that it buttons on the opposite side of a man's shirt so that you make sure you're wearing a, a lady's shirt so that, the judge, so that the people in your church cannot judge you. <clears throat> and don't paint yourself in the corner like they did in the certain campgrounds that we used to be a part of. And the, the men were, were so old cutting the boards that the women said, well, we'll go up top and uh, we will... Uh, handle the boards up there because you may fall because you're an old man. And the old man gladly cut the boards while the ladies went up on top with their dresses. And then they would all repent at night time at the camp meeting. Oh Lord, forgive me. I've seen any, if I've seen anything that's not pleasing to you. <clears throat> the ladies would tie their dresses around their legs but they would never wear a pair of slacks. Well, let me tell you what a a dress is that's tied around your legs. It's called skorts or it's called shorts. It's called pants. And we, we get into legalism. We can't wear any makeup. <coughs> so one of the heads of this ministry said to me one time, when I go on television, people say, but you look so pretty. And you didn't wear any makeup. How did you get that rouge on your face if you don't wear makeup? She says, no, I, I never, I've never worn makeup. I refuse to wear makeup. I, I'm holy before the Lord. Well, where did you get those red cheeks from? Well, I take a, a dry washcloth and I scrub my cheek area here till it breaks the blood vessels. And then it, it turns rosy red and I go out on the TV cameras and I say, dear God, rather than harm your body, which is the temple of the Lord, rather than, just, you know, defile the temple of God, put on some rouge. If you think you need it, put it on. And when you don't think you need it, take it off. You're not going to heaven or hell based on your rouge. Don't get me into it. Don't preach messages. 
that bring me into condemnation. If I open the first two buttons of my shirt, first of all, I don't have a black hairy chest. Mine's white, thank you very much. <laughs> Second of all, if I wear a short sleeve shirt, the ladies are not going to go to hell for lusting after my arms. <clears throat> Thirdly, if my wife wears open toe shoes, I've, I've wrecked... I've, Racked my whole brain. I've never known a time that her open toes shoes caused my heart to faint or flip or lust or anything else. But there are some men in the world that have foot fetishes, so if you're around them, make sure you wear closed toe shoes. Dear Lord, where's it all going to end? If my heart condemned me not. Happy is the man that is not condemned for the things that he alloweth. And unhappy and unhealthy is the person that is condemned in the things that they allow. you got to settle this thing. Now, go back to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to make the conclusion of the matter. Verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that verse right there can bring you into condemnation. What do you mean, Pastor Bennett? Well, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Oh, if you walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And what does that mean? Well, you know, brother, sometimes I walk after the Spirit. And when are those times, sir? Well, when I'm praying. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Okay, then spend your whole day praying. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I now put the key in the car, oh, Lord, and I turn it on. And everything I do, I do in the name of Jesus only. Hallelujah. And what do you do when you poop? Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh. There's some things in life you just need to do. I just don't see myself worshiping God on the toilet. It's hard enough that I've grown to feel His presence in the shower. And every now and then, a thought will come to me, do you think the angels see us in the shower? And I say, I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> and I have to make myself think, well, when I'm in the shower, the angels, they turn their back, but they're still with me. They camp around around those that serve the Lord. Oh, shut up already. Amen. And what tie should I wear in the morning? After all, someone could come to the Lord with the tie. So I wore this one today, and I just knew the anointing of God was going to flow because the Holy Spirit led me. I said, Lord, what tie would you have me wear? And the Lord says, that one. I thought, well, it does match. The Lord says, I know how to match clothes. You become condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Just stop there. Just put the other part in some sort of parenthesis that doesn't bring you under legalism who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. I'm walking after the Spirit of God today. Yeah. Though, I ate, though I may eat some eggs and bacon. Hallelujah. Yeah. While I'm eating, I don't feel in the Spirit. I'm not lost in the Spirit. I'm not praying in other tongues. It's sort of hard to pray in other tongues while you're swallowing bacon. And bacon tastes so good. Oh, but it's a pig. God, forgive me for eating pig. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. 
Read 1 John where it says that I cannot even sin. Wrap your head around that one. Because the seed of God remaineth in me. Therefore, if I find myself in a bad situation and I'm doing something that I know to be a sin, deep inside, I'm not sinning. Amen. Wrap your head around that one. Yeah. Or live the rest of your life being condemned because every day you're going to make some mistake. This past week I had to ask someone to forgive me for something that I said and did. And God knows my heart. But sometimes we don't express our heart the way we know it, the way we feel it. Offenses will come. But the blood of Jesus is greater than our offenses. And thank God that someone taught me. Just say, find the area you were wrong and say, I was wrong in this area. Will you forgive me? When we get so high and mighty that we believe that what we believe is okay and what you believe is not okay, we set ourselves up as judges of the universe and we cannot fellowship with people the way we should. And that carries over in our life where something that's happened in our past nags at us and we don't totally finish it. And it brings liver, kidney, mental, whatever. All sorts of maladies. I, I want to know, many years I read that word malady. Well, it's sickness, it's disease, it's, it's, it's a, causes problems. It opens doors for the devil to come in and attack us here and attack us there. Why? Because the door of condemnation is Satan's door, but the door of our heart that convicts us is God's door. There's a conviction of God that is from God. But there's a condemnation that is not from God. And it's hard for you to discern the two. But I will tell you something very clearly today. I will not walk in condemnation. I don't want my face wrinkled. I don't want my heart bugging out on me. I don't want my liver stop. I don't want my liver to quiver. I don't want there to be intestinal disorders in my body. And so I'm not going to entertain unforgiveness. I'm going to forgive everybody. Somebody say forgive and you will be forgiven. I'm not going to let condemnation over the struggle to forgive to bring something on me just because I didn't lick the forgiveness thing already quick enough. While I'm working through my unforgiveness, I'm going to be saying, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, you know my heart. I want to forgive. I'm looking to you for forgiveness. Help me to forgive. I, I know that smoking is wrong. I'm looking for deliverance. But I'm not going to be condemned in the thing that I'm allowing until you give me the power to overcome it. Because opinionated condemnation is not of God. The other word for condemnation is a is a is is to me it's almost the same, but it's really not the same. It's to find fault with blame, to accuse or condemn. But it is not the same as condemnation coming from opinions. If your heart condemn you not. You have confidence toward God. Your heart, your, the, the Holy Spirit is a righteous judge. But it says here in this scripture, don't judge another man's servant. Don't judge another man's servant. 
I'm not your servant. You're not my servant. I'm not going to judge you harshly. When you mess up in the church, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the discipline should be? It's so easy to want people to be punished. Because after all, I was punished. The Bible says, when you rejoice because your adversary is getting dealt with, then God will withhold right. his punishment. Right. But if you have a heart to meet your adversary's need when he comes under judgment, then that judgment is liable to go on for a long time. God will deal with them. It's so easy to be happy. When you see finally God dealing with someone. And it's so natural to do it. But it's the best way I know to get your friend or your foe to no longer be punished. Just rejoice when he gets in trouble. But if you try to meet his need when he's in trouble, then God will get, give him the thorough discipline. Can you say amen? I find it very interesting that John had that scripture. It's Galatians 3. 13. I want us to turn to it. I think the Lord set us up today in this message. I want you all to know that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But I want you to know the bottom line of the message is that if you walk in condemnation, you open the door for sickness and disease in your life. You need to make sure that every single thing that haunts you from your past is confessed and gotten rid of. You need to make sure that you do not allow condemnation in your life. You're not going to be condemned. When you identify condemning uh, from yourself or condemnation from others, you need to get away from that as fast as you can. Because to correct someone is, to not, con is not to condemn them. Correct me, but don't condemn me. Don't browbeat me. Tell me where I'm wrong and just let me go. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. You want to live under the law? Live under the law. You can't. You cannot fulfill the law. Only Christ fulfilled the law. And he became a curse for us to remove the curse of the law out of the way. Does that mean it's okay to drink? Not for you. I can tell when you ask the question. You can never drink. But the Christians in Germany drink beer. The Christians in Italy drink wine. And I asked this Italian family in New York City, why is it that you have wine at this spaghetti dinner that they gave for the Zion Corlears? And they said, oh, we drink wine with our meals. I said, well, do you drink between meals? Oh, no, that would be a sin. I thought to myself, they've got it all worked out. And when you think you've got it all worked out, you're falling into the trap where you're going to cause a brother to stumble, where you're going to do or say something that's not pleasing to the Lord. And so you better be willing and able and ready to say, I was wrong in the way I challenged you on what you believed. Will you forgive me? You don't have to say, I was wrong in what I believe. But you've got to be willing to say I was wrong in some facet of this discussion. Otherwise he would have never or she would have never been offended. Offenses will come. That's not the issue. How offenses are dealt with separates the chiefest of friends. 
The offense is not the problem. The offense is something, the burr under the saddle. It's the way they were raised. It's what's happening to them in their life right now. It's the things and situations and circumstances that have brought them to this point. And when you say or do anything that displeases another person, instead of justifying what you're saying, please try to find, please try to listen, please try to know what they're going through. Don't judge another man until you walk in his moccasins for five miles. It's an old Indian saying. When I was a Cherokee Indian, that's what we believed. No, I was never a Cherokee Indian. So, there are ways to deal with things in our lives. But I'm telling you all today, the flip side of this that I'm preaching, and listen to me carefully, if you don't know anything in your heart, Janet, Bev, and everyone else, if you don't know anything in your heart where you should be condemned, then quit being condemned and receive all the blessings of God. Say to your body, wait a minute, why do I feel condemned? Just being, just growing up in the church can bring a spirit where you feel like you have to be condemned. Just older people around you that you know the way they looked at you. You know the way they acted. You were happy in church, so you were jumping around. And they corrected you just for jumping around a little bit too much. And so you, you live, you grow up with that. You grow up in a pastor's home where, oh, I don't know if we should do that or not. And half of that is based on we don't know what other people will think about it. When you grow up hearing sermons against going to the movies, and then you dare to walk in a movie hall to see the, the last, what is it called? The, the last, this prophetic movie that's on right now? The Return of Christ or something. The Last Days. It's a Christian movie playing in the movie hall, for goodness sake. And yes, one of the young ladies turns, turns around to get out of her seat in the car and shows a little more leg than I believe is correct. Oh, Lord have mercy. But you grow up with that overshadowing condemnation. And it's so easy for the devil to put on you. Your mother, others have condemned you so much. Rebuke the condemnation. Walk out from underneath it and be made whole in Jesus' name. Whether it's a prevailing, just unspoken, just something you carry, if you're carrying a hint of condemnation, the cells of your body are being affected by your condemnation. Get over it. It's not right for people to drink and get tipsy. It's a sin. It's a sin. But I'm not their judge and I'm not their master. I'm leaving them with God. God, work out. Work on them. I'm not going to walk spewing out condemnation and I will not be condemned. I don't sow it. I'm not going to reap it. There are pastors there are men of God that do things and say things and their lives are such that I cannot hook up with them. I just, I don't, I, but I don't have to, I'm not their boss. I'm not over the whole United States of America. I'm only over the state of Virginia. 
I'm not even over Hopewell. I'm not even over this church. Except spiritually speaking. If you buy a lemon, I'm sorry. I'll help you fix it, but you don't have to come and talk to me before you buy a car. I'm not lording over you. And I don't want to be lorded over. Can you say amen? amen? And here's what the Lord said to me. Tell the people, get out from underneath that condemning atmosphere, that blanket of feeling that you're not perfect. Sometimes I just shout, Thank you, Lord. I'm not perfect. You see, when Paul started out, he said, I'm the chiefest of the apostles. I had a personal revelation from God for three years. Supernaturally, God taught me on the backside of the desert. And when he died, before he died, he said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. You've got to make your calling and election sure. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have got to walk out from underneath this unspoken spirit that always condemns you. And if your heart condemns you not, you will have your healing. You'll have confidence with God. Stand with me to feed everyone. I want... Uh, I really want Janet and Bev to sit up here on the front row. See, I don't think there's any reason for either one of these to feel any condemnation at all. And I don't feel like they do. All right? But I know the devil will make you search. You know? When, when we get sick in our home, we go like this. Lord, if there's anything, any open doors, show us. That's an honest prayer. Can you say amen? But we don't walk under condemnation. Can you say amen? <clears throat>